Hello? This is the panel about population. Uh, population is a subject that's both super important and we're kind of anxious about whether we should talk about it at all. Um, but we've decided to go with the super important and to show it we have more people speaking than at any other plenary panel. <laughs> and, but with great power like this comes great responsibility. So I'm gonna be rigorously enforcing time both on them and on you. So when it comes time for the Q&As, I'm gonna humiliate you if you ask, make statements and don't ask questions. And the way I'm gonna humiliate you is I'm going to, after you make your statement, I'm going to ask you what is your question. And reliably, in my experience, the audience will laugh in not a good way and it will be at you. <laughs> so to avoid social humiliation, think of a question. So these are our speakers. They're, I'm gonna save you a lot of trouble. They're all very distinguished. They're worth listening to. Population begins here with this guy, Malthus, in this book he published in 1798. This is the fundamental argument of Malthus. Probably most of you have seen this at some point. The production of food goes up in a linear fashion. The number of people goes up in an exponential fashion. Where the lines cross, very bad things happen. Now, if you put this in modern language, it's saying the biotic potential, in other words, the maximum rate of reproduction of something like wheat is like that. The biotic potential of people is like that. And that for some reason, that biotic potential of people, the maximum rate of reproduction, is always, in every circumstance, much, much greater than that of food crops. That's the fundamental argument of Malthus. I'm now going to give you, I use Mac Paint, I think, to show you all of the evidence that uh, Malthus <laughs> adduced for this statement that one species is inherently more faster reproductive rate than all other species. So fortunately, we have a modern version of this. This came out in the uh, 1940s and largely from Aldo Leopold and this guy, uh, William Vogt, who nobody um, has heard of. I tried to write, a, recently wrote a book trying to make people have heard of him. I have totally failed. Um, and what they came up with is they took, they hauled out an idea from an obscure corner of ecology called carrying capacity, and this is the foundational idea of the environmental movement, that there are natural processes with limits that we exceed to our peril. This is the first modern we're all going to hell book that Vogt wrote. Um, and you have many, many different versions of that idea that are you know, prominent in ecology. We call it you know, um, ecological limits, uh, carrying capacity, planetary boundaries. This idea gave rise to a modern version of the overpopulation, which is, yes, we may be able to feed people, but we're gonna wreck the ecosystems on which our life depends in the effort to do that. In the 1960s, 70s, 80s, and all the way up to the beginning of the 21st century, this led to powerful anti-population campaigns that were a human rights disaster, tens of millions of forced abortions, tens of millions of um, forced sterilizations all over the place. They were horrible. So one of the things that's difficult about talking about population is there's this moral miasma over the whole subject. So what I'd like to say to you is everybody here knows this. Because in my experience, often when people talk about population, there are people in the audience who feel it necessary to remind us of this history. We all know it. It's terrible. Nonetheless, bravely, we're going to try and talk about it, this subject. So, the fundamental facts are that our, the, in the lifetime of many of the people in this room, um, two astounding things have happened. The first is this extraordinary rise in human population, and the second and subsequent one is this incredible collapse in fertility. Both of them happened almost at the same time, and it puts us, demographically speaking, in this extraordinary position. We have n nothing like it before or since, and the, what, so what this should do is, this tells us that we're going to, um, huge changes in this realm are possible. This is the uh, most current, uh, came out last week, UN projection of where the, you know, these UN demographers think the population is going to end up. The red bar says that around 2100, we're gonna end up with something on the order of 11 billion people and, and level off. Now, the first thing I should tell you is that this is a projection for 80 years into the future. If you went back to 1970, which is only 50 years back, and looked at the projections made by the same people, they were catastrophically wrong. 
that we have a terrible record in this. Nonetheless, this is what we have. So this is covered in addition with a miasma of bad history, with a miasma of uncertainty. What they tell you, and this is all the case, is that birth rates have collapsed, and the UN um, believes that somewhere in the latter part of this century, the world is going to be at what's called replacement level, and that the population is um, going to level off, and that this is happening all over the world, although at different times in different places. When that happens, if it does happen, we're going to be also in a fundamentally different place. Normally, there's a whole lot of young people and a small number of old people, and that's been it's called the population pyramid. It's shown over there on the side of the picture. This is this idea that this is the demographic age structure of all um, populations, and this has been changing, and we're now going to end, and there's the fundamental part of that is there's lots and lots of young people and very few old farts like myself. Now, what we're going to have in 2060 and beyond is a tremendous oversupply of people like me and a tiny number and a many too many few people who are younger than, than us. And uh, we don't know what's going to happen with that. And one of the speakers is going to um, speculate on this with great empirical backing. So <laughs> that's my introduction to Paul. Um, <laughs> so, here are some questions for today. I'm sorry for the enormous amount of text, but one question is what does overpopulated mean? We talk about what is overpopulated. I mean, how would you know if an area has got too many people? Um, when we say we're using too much of the Earth's resources, what is the right indicator? Uh, if the world is overpopulated, well, what do you do about it? Are we going to kill a whole lot of people like me? I mean, that would be pretty smart for many reasons, but are we going to do it? Can we reduce numbers humanely? I and mean, what, also, what should be the target? How many people like me should we kill? Um, and how do we know? Most, but again, not all, demographers, as I said, believe that human numbers will peak. And if there is a baby buff, are you going to have to worry about underpopulation, which is a very weird concept. Also, the same question applies. You, can, if you computer scientists can loop back to the beginning and ask the question, what about underpopulation with the same numbers there? Um, if the fundamental ecological issue is consumption, you know, what do all those people consume rather than their sheer numbers, um, can consumption and economic growth be decoupled, this was a recession, so that we may not, so that growth could continue if we wanted to, even if the harmful times of consumption fell. I don't think anybody really knows, but we're going to have very informed and expert speculation. And then the other part is that birth rates have fallen worldwide. Why? And the two main mechanisms suggested, economic growth empowering, is one more important um, than the other. So these are pretty heavy questions, um, and we're I'm happy to say, probably not going to answer all of them, but we're going to be, uh, we're going to be explore our ignorance in a much more informed way. And that's what I have to say. Let me now introduce Karen Schrag, the first of our extremely excellent panelists. No pressure. Uh, I have to get through this really fast. I feel like I'm a racehorse. I'm going to talk really fast. And no, no, I won't talk that fast, I promise. Um, so if I don't get through all of my slides today, I'm going to tell you one thing. And that is that um, in the course of my talk and our BFK, we will have added 10,000 people net gain to our planet. Net gain, births minus deaths. Um, I hope to not leave here today with tired treads on my back because I know I am sticking my neck out in groups that feel that um, I may be being uh, uh, too bold or, or in, incorrect or not very uh, caring. I would have stayed home and gardened if I didn't care. I believe we're headed in the wrong direction. I'm only here to pull us back. Um, I believe that I can show what I care about with my hands. This is where we're growing, and this is what's happening to our resources. In that gap is misery, suffering, and early death. And all we can do politically correctly is try to be wizards and make corn grow faster. And what happens is the more you feed people, the more they grow. And this, in this gap, I want to bring it down with very, very humane, but we've got to go down to small, small families, because otherwise, we look at a world of misery, suffering, and early death. So that's my main message. We'll go through the slides, see how far I get. So um, this is my story. I hope you can connect to it in some way. I spent my life trying to do right by the environment. I became a vegetarian. I started an organics recycling program. Um, I joined four co-ops. 
I led trips to the rainforest. I even got a boa constrictor and a parrot I didn't really care for, um, who I decided was a male because every time I came out of the shower, he whistled. Um, and you can't tell if parrots are male or female until they're like two or three years old, but that was my clue. Um, I led trips to the rainforest and tried to help save them. I taught classes about conservation. I'm about to retire from 28 years as a director of a nature center, and I keep trying my best. Um, and I had a public program on something we used to call global warming back in 1988, thinking this won't happen in my lifetime, but it's probably a pretty good thing to start talking about. I also spent my time on other issues that mattered to me. I became a peace activist, an anti-war protester, and I was the vice president of the peace organization called World Citizen Inc. Uh, I'm a feminist, I'm a pro-choice activist, I'm an environmental educator, as I mentioned, Woodlake Nature Center is where I have uh, my home away from home uh, in Minnesota where I reside. Uh, but I didn't see much progress. I woke up every day and went, God, things aren't getting better. I'm working so hard. And so many of my colleagues, you are all working hard to make the world a better place. With some remarkable exceptions, I felt like I was spinning around in a wheel, working really hard and not getting very far. I finally realized that I had to stop ignoring numbers. Uh, my parents, my lovely parents, I start to cry now because they're still around and they're celebrating their 70th anniversary this year. And um, they were born in 1925 when the world had a population I believe we could have sustained. And in their lifetimes, five and a half billion people have added. And we're growing, as I mentioned, just to get you an idea. If you wanted to snap your fingers every second, you know how long it would take you to get to a million seconds? A million seconds? You'd get sore fingers because you'd be doing that for 11 days. Now, if you were to snap your fingers for one billion seconds, you're going to be doing that for over 31 years. And that's the difference between a million and a billion. I know I can't even wrap my head around it. So to me, upstream means go to the source of the problem. Downstream acts try to shortcut the way to solutions by avoiding the hard issues, not because they aren't the cause of the problems, because they are really difficult to discuss, and I do acknowledge that. Yes, only discussing climate change, loss of species, water pollution, scarcity is downstream thinking if overpopulation does not have a seat at the table, and we've been thrown under the bus for a really long time. Keep in mind, Paul Ehrlich, one of my heroes, was on The Tonight Show 19 times. I love Stephen Colbert. I really love Trevor Noah. Trevor Noah. I have never seen them invite on an overpopulation activist. It is under the bus. To move upstream means to see the biggest picture possible, that we are no different than geese and deer and rabbits, with the exception that we are a predator, top of the food chain species. We have actually turned the food pyramid around. Owls are supposed to be the least numerous, and we have done this. I can say no more as a naturalist than grasshoppers are supposed to be a lot, and we have put the grasshoppers um, on top to our own de detriment. As long as we don't think that organic food and composting and cloth bags and wind power and the latest whatever technology will be the only salve we need. Overpopulation has been swept under the rug of political correctness and ecological foolishness. We are five and a half billion people overpopulated. This is according to Global Footprint Network, who measures resources and people and the gaps in between. And we cannot continue to sustain us or grow a population. So I stop giving to those who think and thank us with address labels and promises that are never delivered. As apex predators, we cannot help but consume especially in a modern world, and pushing 8 billion, growing by 1 million in four and a half days, we only can turn down the volume at us. We're like a bathtub, and we, we, we keep getting towels and mopping up the mess, and we keep forgetting to turn off the faucet. It made me realize that my long ago choice to teach children instead of having them was the most environmental choice I could make. Overpopulation is a ratio of demand to supply. It's not just a number. It's a relationship. If too many people demand water from a well, that will go rock, dry. That is overpopulation. We ignore this truth because we don't like seeing ourselves as the enemy of our own existence. That is another main point I want to make today, when it is our denial that is to blame. Don't you want a better world? 
to move upstream as a clarion call to solve overpopulation by showing the world that one-child families are an opportunity to create a pathway toward achieving our goals of justice to get back some greater degree of agency, restore wildlife, and the possibility of creating a truly livable planet. Um, all those projections that you see, if we're already overpopulated, why are we talking about growth? Because that's like saying, oh goody, we get to drown in 30 feet instead of 300 feet of water, we're still drowning. To ignore the role overpopulation plays is doom. Our planet is going to be doomed, I believe, to a horrible fate. To address it is an act of compassion. Love must be our motivation. People ask me if I'm optimistic or pessimistic. I said, you know what, I, I don't go there. I just, I love, I love this planet. I love the species in it. I love people and I want to do right by them. If we love our children and love our planet, we must get on board and push over population to the forefront of our concerns. To do nothing will have dire consequences and I'm just afraid we're really good at doing nothing. Peace, justice, human rights cannot exist when a limited planet is being filled with unlimited people. So I invite you to join me upstream where the full truth lives and a better world is possible. And I did it in eight minutes. Thank you very much. I may have one or two things to say in response to Karen. Um, <laughs> But I'll do that in the discussion. So I wanted to start by showing you this graph. It shows uh, four different IPCC scenarios for carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. They range from the, what's called the RCP 2.6, where carbon dioxide levels go from um, today peak below 450 and then decline after that. That's sort of the good, that's the Good scenario, and we have the RCP 8.5, where the in the blue line where carbon levels go to, uh, you know, pretty scary levels. All of these four scenarios are based on a set of assumptions about socioeconomic and technological changes, including uh, population and GDP. Now, what's interesting about this is that the worst case scenario, still the RCP 8.5 not only has high population, it actually has among the lowest levels of GDP. So that might strike you as a little bit counterintuitive if you're in the mindset or framework of thinking about things uh, in terms of the classic IPAT formula. So environmental impacts being a function of population, affluence, and technology. And I think even though you can't really uh, say that this identity is wrong in itself, it is sort of a frame framework that a lot of people are used to thinking. And you'd think then that the worst case scenario would be high population, high affluence, and bad technologies. Um, or, you know, that the best case scenario in this sense would be low population, less affluence, and better technologies. Um, now, the sort of ethics of arguing for lower affluence might be dubious, but I think thinking in this way is also misleading in itself because it ignores all the strong linkages between population, affluence, and technology. And I'm going to argue that a plausible pathway to a more environmentally friendly world actually goes in part through higher affluence, which brings with it lower population and better technologies. Um, you can think of it the other way around too. If you have a world of good technologies and low population, you probably have a world uh, of high affluence. So to better understand these connections, and especially the connection between population and affluence, uh, some colleagues at the University of Tasmania and I built a model that's based on the strong correlation between uh, population growth and GDP, so especially fertility and mortality and GDP. You can see this connection here in this graph. One dot is one country, and it shows fertility as a function of income or GDP per capita, and you'll notice that Below $1,000 per capita, you barely have any countries that have a fertility rate below four. And above 20,000, you have barely any countries that are at replacement rate. Most of them are under. Um, so we took this correlation, 
and we use the business as usual forecast of GDP to make a range of scenarios for global population this century. And our baseline scenario is shown there in, in the black line. It has population go to 9.2 billion in 2050. It peaks at 9.3 around 2060 and then goes down again to 8.5 billion in 2100. So that's actually quite different from the UN scenario. But the, our point wasn't really to make a better prediction. Uh, what we wanted to do was explore how much would, you know, how different would population be under different uh, scenarios of socioeconomic development and income growth in particular. And that's what the colored lines are about. So the GDP variation zero, which is the line at top, is where you have no economic development, no economic growth this century. Um, and the variation two is where you have double annual growth. And you can see that after 2050 in particular, there's a really strong divergence in population scenarios depending on these different uh, trajectories in economic development. Uh, much of this is actually driven not by what happens in the rich world, but what happens in developing countries, especially in sub-Saharan Africa. So it seemed then that the conclusion would be that you know, economic growth drives slower population growth. But of course, this, the correlations here aren't evidence of that in themselves. It might be that just population or GDP is actually just correlated with things like education that are the actual causal drivers of slower population growth. And that's true to some extent. The, the connection, the causal connection between women's education in particular and fertility rates is both strong and well established. Um, we know that with women's education in particular, coupled with women's rights, women have more opportunities, more job opportunities outside the household, which makes the opportunity cost of staying home for a really long period in your life much higher. We know that at the same time, sending children to school instead of having them work on the farm can sort of have them go from a net income source actually to a net cost. But we must kind of zoom out a little bit and look at why a larger share of the population gets educated in the first place. And here's where we need to think about economic development, and especially changes in the structure of economy that make skilled labor much more profitable than unskilled labor. This has been seen, uh, you can think of it as actually inducing the changes in education in the first place that then in turn kind of drives slower population growth. It means by economic development, women's education and family planning are really complementary. If there weren't any jobs outside the household, outside the agrarian economy, educating women wouldn't have as much an, an effect as if there are plenty of opportunities outside. The same is true in some ways about family planning. It is, uh, you can, you know, the opportunity costs and the, the reasons and drivers why you might have smaller families need to be there to some extent. There needs to be demand for family planning um, for that to actually make a, a bigger impact on population growth. And it's typically in the places where we see all three happening at the same time, economic development, family planning, and education, where we see the fastest declines in, uh, in population growth. Uh, an example that comes to mind in, in, is Indonesia, for example, where this really happened. Now, it's important to note that things like women's education, women's rights, access to family planning, um, and so on, don't need to be motivated by concerns about population. These are ends in their own right. And in a way, those are things we know we should be doing anyway, and you do them, and slower population growth is sort of a, uh, a, a side effect almost of that. So looping back to the environmental impacts, then you have economic developments, education, slower population growth, and improved technology that are all mutually reinforcing. And that's why I think that there's a good chance that a lower impact, a more environmentally friendly world in the future is actually a world of higher, not lower affluence. That's quite explicitly what, what the creators of the climate scenarios had in mind, and I think it's gonna be true for many other environmental impacts as well. Thank you.
Good morning. Um, my name is Alicia Graves. I'm not on the uh, speakers list. I'm filling in for uh, the original speaker, Sarah Meyer, who was, is with uh, Project Drawdown. And I'm in touch with her because I did some of the analysis for Project Drawdown on family planning and girls' education. Um, thank you. And uh, to start with, I just want to remind people that large families are the default position for heterosexual couples. And so to achieve a smaller family, we need to make consistent, correct measures to separate having sex from having children over a long period of time. And I think people forget that when they're talking about population. So an average American woman wants to have two children. She will spend about five years of her life trying to conceive pregnant or lactating and, and not fertile. She'll spend about, and I have, will be spending about 30 years trying to manage my fertility. And so you can't understate the importance of family planning in this, um, in this respect. And I will say I am hugely in favor of education. I appreciate my last, the last speaker's comments. But the, the letters after my name, the Masters in Public and Health, don't affect my fertility, right? So that we need to have a way to, edu education in itself is not going to solve the problem. We already saw this. I want to point out that the, uh, these are the new UN projections from came out Monday. The dotted blue lines. Um, are the difference between the median projection if you have, if the global fertility is half a child higher, then by the end of the century, we'll, we'll, we will be at 15.6 billion, keeping the other assumptions constant. If the average fertility is a half a child lower, by the end of the century, we could be at 7.3 billion. When uh, Paul Ehrlich wrote uh, The Population Bomb, it was in 1968, there were 3.5 billion people on Earth. Population was growing at 2%, which meant about an additional 60 million people every year. Now we're at 7.7 .7 billion. Population is growing at 1%, and that equals an additional 82 million births over deaths a year. It's like adding a new Germany to Earth every year. So <clears throat> um, I want to say that Voluntary family planning works. Women want it. Um, and, and, and there are around the world two, an estimated 220 million women who want to either stop having children or space their next pregnancy by two years, but aren't using any modern contraception. So I think the number one thing that we can do is make sure that those women have the information and means to separate having sex from having kids. And we've, um, we've seen that this can be tremendously effective through voluntary family planning programs. And there are examples from around the world where fertility has fallen really fast through good voluntary family planning policies and programs. This is a quote from the International Conference on Population and Development. Reproductive rights rest on the recognition of the basic rights of all couples and individuals to decide freely and responsibly the number, spacing, and timing of their children, and to have the information and means to do so in the right to attain the highest standard of sexual and reproductive health. And that, these rights need to be balanced with our rights and the rights of our children and grandchildren to live in a, in a, in a sustainable world which is a hard thing to parse out, but we'll save that for the discussion. Um, this is separating sex from having kids is another kind of decoupling. I know that's been on the agenda. <laughs> yeah. So this is a, a paper that I find uh, fascinating. It looks at this concept of carbon legacies, that it's not only our children with their, with their carbon footprints, but it will be their children and so forth. And so Murtaugh and Schlacks found that Choosing to have one fewer child <clears throat> is going to, in, in the context of the U.S. and in, in, in the context of high-emitting countries, choosing to have one fewer child is going to do more for the environment than anything, everything else we can do combined. So this is a huge opportunity because in the United States, about one in two children are un, about, sorry, about one in two pregnancies are unintended, and of the unintended pregnancies, about one in two of those will go on to be a live birth or. Um, 
I will say that Malthus wasn't totally wrong, and um, one part of the world where his predictions, unfortunately, are coming true and have been for many decades now is um, parts of Sub-Saharan Africa, especially a part of the, of the, reg a part of the world where we are focused, which is called the Sahel region. It's an ecological transition zone south of the Sahara. I wish I had put a map of it. Um, uh, Stunting is at about 44% in Niger, which is at the heart of it, just north of Nigeria. Northern Nigeria has similar stunting rates. Um, that means that children are not growing to their physical or intellectual potential, which I think is a tragedy. And, um, and yet, and, and there's a high desire for family size. These are the poorest countries in the world with the highest fertility rates. Um, that said, there are, in all the countries except for Senegal, which has had a very good family planning program in the last few years, in all of these countries, the number of women who have an unmet need for family planning, who say they want to space or stop having kids but aren't using modern contraception, is greater and often twice as great as the women who are contracepting. So this, again, is, a, is an opportunity. Um, Something I was reading recently around fertility decision making, and I don't even like that term because it usually is just, again, default or happening by accident, but we are social animals and we do want to conform. And so when, in the US, when our friends and neighbors are all having two children, if you ask a young woman how many children she wants, she will usually say two. In Niger, when, when women's friends and neighbors are having 7.6 children and you ask how many they want, they actually say 10. But there are plenty of women in Niger who want, again, to, to space or stop having kids. And so and, and this, this is a moving target. The unmet need is a moving target. So as more women contracept effectively and they see the benefits and the ability to better educate and feed their children, this will change as well. Um, we, uh, we've touched on the importance of education. This is a girl from one of our programs in northern Nigeria. Um, and we know that the benefits of educating girls are huge socially, um, economically, and uh, in terms of uh, fertility. So we should be investing in quality education for secondary education for girls. It's the best alternative to early marriage and childbearing, especially in sub-Saharan African context. We need to increase the funding of family planning. And it's a, currently about 1% of all overseas development aid. And it's an investment and not a cost, because in uh, where voluntary family planning programs are effective, there are huge savings in all of the other sectors. You don't need to train as many teachers, nurses, build as many schools, hospitals, et cetera. Um, and we need to understand that it's OK to talk about links between population and the environment, and we know um, what to do to shape it. Um, so. I want to just say one thing since I didn't get my bio. Um, this is the organization that I run. Um, we are aiming to help stabilize global population by the end of the century and, yes, then bring it downwards um, in a rights-based framework. And the OASIS Initiative is a project of UC Berkeley and my organization, and our mission is to help accelerate this transition in the Sahel region of Africa. And we're always looking for partners. Thank you very much. Good morning. Uh, there's nothing quite as refreshing as a heaping plate of Soylent Green first thing in the morning. Um, there's two things I don't want to discuss here. First is whether overpopulation represents a threat to anything, including the Earth's productive systems. David Harvey puts it best on this question when he said, when a theory of overpopulation seizes hold in a society dominated by an elite, then the non-elite invariably experience some kind of political, economic, and social repression. The second thing I don't want to discuss is, uh, in my short time, is whether my R squared is better than your R squared, Linus. Whether economic growth or women's empowerment and autonomy is better or more predictive driver of demographic transition. It's not an especially important question. I agree that it's kind of all lumped together. And since both are obviously very influential, but I point out that one can happen without the other, and I can tell you which I'd choose if I had to. And I really appreciate uh, the work on voluntary. Uh, birth control uh, efforts uh, around the world. I want to instead take my time to ask a different question. It's, uh, what's, what's capitalism going to do without uh, population growth? What is, pop, what, is, what is the global economy going to look like at ZPG? 
Uh, this is not a hypothetical question. It's an inevitable one, the answer to which we will learn in the lifetimes of the youngest people now living and many people in this room. There are several sub-arguments to this that maybe we can play out in Q&A that uh, stress the importance of this question. I'll go through these four. One, the modern economy developed exactly during the small, indeed tiny, window of time in which exponential population growth occurred in the history of humanity. These two phenomena are coterminous. Second, all our ideas about the capitalist economy were developed exactly during the same period. Every theory from Adam Smith all the way to contemporary economic uh, theorizations occurred right under the conditions and context of uh, exponential growth. Three, demographic transition is ongoing, it's real, and it's advancing more rapidly than predicted. And four, this means that the solution to the inevitable cyclical and catastrophic, catastrophic economic crises uh, that we see in the modern economy cannot be solved either by either of the traditional ways out, which is a reserve army of the unemployed for wage relief or expanding markets to the extension of goods and services to new human beings. So let's take each of these in turn. The period of population growth is really short. The peak population growth in the world, right, it peaked in the early 60s. Now that doesn't mean we don't have too many people. There's not a lot of people. There's certainly too many people in Phoenix. <laughs> uh, having said that, having said that, this will look, future historians will have to have a name for this very, very brief period which comes with the explosive affluence uh, and transitions uh, around the world in the post-colonial era. Second, all of our knowledge about the economy is focused on and dependent upon assumptions of growth. So here's the population of Scotland. Scotland figures big for all of these thinkers, Malthus and Smith, and they were just obsessed with Scotland. Um, and here's the period of, of demographic growth in Scotland, and here are all the major works of 19th century political economy. Uh, they, this isn't a coincidence, right? And the, and the movement of, 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 of Scots uh, into the dark satanic mills of northern England and their, and their being put off the land coincides with this happy, set, with the exception of the guy in the middle, Marx, uh, this celebration of the, of the modern economy. This goes on into the 20th century. Here's the population of India from 1800 to 2011. And here are all the major works of modernization theory. They're all predicated and conditioned in this brief period, which is about to end. All right. So that's... That's my second point. Third point is that demographic transition is real, inevitable, and swift. Half the countries of the world are now under the replacement rate. It's good news. Under, am I that boring? <laughs> two, two, 2.1 2. or less. Now, that's not enough, and Sub-Saharan Africa is, is a place of explosive growth, and it's, it's a, obviously a, a serious uh, set of concerns for, uh, for resources. But we have other problems in places where growth has stopped. For example, the dependency ratio, uh, which was alluded to, when I am sitting and somebody's going to have to change my bag, it's going to be somebody from Sub-Saharan Africa because, it, and I'll, I'm willing to bet on that to those futurists out in the room, right, who that's going to be, because the inversion of the population pyramid means a dependency ratio in places like China that really represent an economic challenge. And then there are these really bizarre pro-natalist things going on all over the world where uh, population growth has stopped. All kinds of ethno-chauvinistic, uh, bizarre policies and, and practices. I've written about this for Breakthrough before, including something called Love Jihad, which is essentially an anti-Muslim kind of conspiracy theory amongst uh, Hindu nationalists about population changes uh, and marriages. Uh, and third, there'll be environmental implications. I think most of us are, are excited about the idea that uh, depopulation in rural areas might lead to forest transition, but my own experience in India is that intensification often follows the, the departure of labor. So it, it, it doesn't necessarily have to have a happy ending, but it will have environmental implications. Okay, so finally, and this is really my most important argument with three minutes to go, is that capitalism safety valves have always depended on demographic growth. Uh, and what do I mean by that? I mean that on the one hand, crises of underproduction are typically addressed by seeking wage relief. Uh, this is a central tenet of defensible modernization theory. This is the noble economist uh, Arthur Lewis, the first black man to receive a Nobel Prize in economics, he famously demonstrated that industrialization was bootstrapped by demographic rural abundance that depressed urban wages and allowed growth to occur throughout the developing world in the post-war era. Uh, well, in post-growth regions, this exploitative resource is no longer there. On the other hand, crises of overproduction are often assuaged by the opening of markets in areas of high reproductivity, and in post-growth regions, abundance and prosperity can obviously substitute, but only to a point. And it's something I've taken up with uh, Harry Saunders previously. So what's capitalism going to do? Well, uh, 
I don't know. That's why I find this question really interesting. Uh, <laughs> Um, what machinations will capital have to require to maintain surplus without population growth in a world that is energy abundant, right, but labor scarce? I think that's a, a fair question uh, to ask. Now, for many in my audience, and I'm looking at you, Harry, are you here? Hi, Harry. Uh, the market will just take care of this. Increases in wages will then increase buying power. People will buy more stuff, and they'll be more affluent, and it'll all be great. But my experience in Karnataka and in Wisconsin is that's not what happens. Labor scarcity actually produces a set of gymnastics in agricultural uh, production, which are usually about the production function. They have to change the way they do business because the labor is not available. That's true in California almonds, apparently, as I learned yesterday. So labor scarcity is a really real problem. And, um, and it, this can end well or it can end badly, would be what I'd say. Leaving, um, which is to say, I think we should be prepared to accept the answer that at least in the short run, and the absence of new and more drastic regulatory mechanisms, capital will try to squeeze its margins out of nature instead of out of labor, where it always could get them in the past. And that possibility is about as likely as it is appalling to me, given the current socioecology of our already very late demographic transition period. So to sum up, population growth is ending. I think we underestimate the novelty of that moment. I mean, my kids are going to live to my kid. I'm only having one. You're welcome. Uh, is going to live to live in a period of population growth that has not been this low since before the Industrial Revolution. Like, that's why I'm still a modernist, right? I mean, that's quite remarkable. Um, but I think we underestimate the economic portent of that transition, and I think we're largely asking the wrong questions. Thanks.